what if I told you, you don't have to sit alone in grief anymore? This is Natasha Smith, and you are listening to the Can You Just Sit With Me podcast. I am super excited for you to hear from Emily Lawson. She is a needed voice in the grief and loss space on themes of motherhood and loss. You'll hear her story today as she shares about her new book, Cracks in My Cup, Biblical Reflections on Motherhood and Loss. So as always, I'm sure you will find this episode helpful as well as hopeful. So listen in and join the conversation. So I'm so excited to be sitting with Emily this morning, and I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in. Um, Can you tell us a time, tell us about a time when you wanted to ask someone this question, can you just sit with me? Sure. There have been so many. There have been so many in my last several years. I think the one that drove them all and that have has opened the door to the rest of them was when my dad died very unexpectedly. It was March of 22. Um, he had he was one week post surgery. That was a very routine surgery. He was two months post into his retirement and his retirement was let's focus on the surgery, get past it and move on. And he was texting in the family chat an hour before I got the phone call from my actually my cousin calling on my mom's phone and everything just came to a screeching halt. And my children at the time were ages three, two, and one. I remember taking the phone call in the backyard and screaming. (laughs) And my kids are like, dad, what's wrong with mom? He's like, um, let's go inside and make dinner. And it was this, this screeching halt to our life, the life that we knew it. And it was in that moment that I didn't, um, I didn't even have the words to ask someone to sit with me, but my best friend came over and did just that. Mm. I was still sitting on my porch in my backyard when she walked in the back fence, probably 15 minutes later and just sat. And as I reflect back on that hour, the thing that I remember telling her about is how my dad had just talked about wanting a pot belly chocolate shake. Mm-hmm. And one of his favorite restaurants here in the Chicagoland area, they lived in Iowa. So he only got it when he came to visit. And she was probably thinking, your dad just died. Why are we talking about chocolate shakes? But it's those little nuggets and nuances of his personality that she didn't ask questions. She didn't try to redirect the conversation into something more serious. She just sat and let me talk. Mm -hmm. And her presence opened the door to what I understood to be like really necessary healing of people sitting and letting you share your story, whatever your story is. Wow. 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 Such a powerful story and just such a powerful um, way that your friend just sat with you. That is just so powerful. For one, I just wanted to just kind of um, recognize like what you, you were saying, like you didn't know what to do or what to ask for, or didn't know at the time that you you even needed someone to sit with you. And and that's um, one thing that I think we where we find ourselves in grief, like, I don't know what to do. We just don't know what to do. And it's kind of like we, you know, we figure it out along the way. And then we're able to look back, like hindsight, of course, is 2020. And we're like, okay, yeah, I needed this, this, and this. But that's why I think it's important for us to have these type of conversations to help those who find themselves like, I don't know what to do. I don't even know what it looks like. You know, is this normal? Am I normal? You know, <laughs> so I love just taking these opportunities to to sit with you and others to have these conversations. So thank you so much for sharing that. And um, just just, you know, a tragic story, right? I'm just, just the loss of your dad, um, but just a beautiful story and how your friend just came and sat with you and didn't ask any questions. So 
thank you so much for sharing that. Tell us, tell us about your story because I know, you know, so you lost your dad, um, but that's not, you know, the the end of your lost story. So tell us your story and then how it informs your book, um, Cracks in My Cup. Yeah, I started writing on the month anniversary after my dad's death. So he died March 16th. April 16th was the Saturday in between Good Friday and Easter. Mm -hmm. And the church was celebrating the resurrection. And I'm like, this doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. And so I started writing really as a way for me to process. I'm, I'm a writer. I, I, I needed to process that. And as I looked back over the course of those 12 months of writings, I, w I saw the Lord carrying me through from very raw, very raw emotions on the one month anniversary to a place of, of gospel truth on the 12 month anniversary. Like mm -hmm. he hasn't left, he's got this. And so it was right around the 12 month anniversary that I went to my church's prayer team to receive inner healing prayer because I was still in such a bad spot emotionally. My anger was coming out so badly towards my children. And, you know, culture is like, well, it's been a year. You should probably yeah. be better by now. I was like, I'm nowhere near better. So I went and I got inner healing prayer. And it was a beautiful, beautiful time of the Lord doing a lot of work in my heart. What came out of that was someone in the prayer team received a vision of a book being handed to me, mm -hmm. an empty book and a pen and a voice said, write a new story. And I said, there is a story to be written. I, I wrote over the last year of how I felt. And now I want to write in reflection of what I know to be true. So one month after my dad's death, this is the raw emotions of what I felt. But as I look back, this is what where the Lord was with me in it, where the like where Jesus was sitting with me yeah. in those very raw mm -hmm. emotions. And so that's what I set out to do in my book, Cracks in My Cup. And the title comes from that that time of prayer where I I was feeling from cultural polls and and cute little sayings on Instagram of you can't pour out of a cup that's empty, but then people are fighting back. Well, and Jesus, your cup overflows. And I'm like, but my cup's not overflowing. Like, why is, what's wrong with me? Like, I'm a Christian. I work at a church. Like I read my Bible. Why is my cup not overflowing? And one of my mentors lovingly blurted out in Jesus, your cup does overflow, but your cup's got cracks in it and you're leaking all over the place. Yeah. And I really resonated with that, not only in the grief of losing my dad, in but also in the grief of my parenting as the, the grief of losing my dad was the trigger that mm -hmm. unearthed the anger that was already there in my parenting. And so it's been this whole process of, my dad's death was the trigger that opened my eyes to needing healing in so many different aspects of my life. And while my children were adopted before my dad died, I'm just now starting to process the grief of their adoption and what that means. And so it's been this kind of rever reverse process, mm -hmm. but I know had my dad not died, like I wouldn't be on this healing process that I'm in right now. Mm -hmm. And I totally get that. Um, I've seen it in my life and others as well. Like, you know, um, maybe, you know, we have, we experience a loss and we're kind of trying to function through that loss, but then another loss comes along and really brings out even think just things we didn't know. Like I know I have a chapter in my book ca called a revealing grief. Mm -hmm. Like it begins to reveal things <laughs> that we didn't even, we weren't aware of. And, and so it becomes this process of kind of, kind of like that, um, the peeling of the onion, right? The mm -hmm. onion peel mm -hmm. of like, oh, okay. Okay. Something else I have to deal with. I put it on the list, you know? <laughs> right, for so, sure. For sure. Yeah. Add, add it to the list. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my goodness. And so I want to kind of, um, kind of, that's a good segue into talking about grief and motherhood. Mm -hmm. And so I want to talk about this. Um, you have, you wrote, um, and I want to just kind of quote this because that is so pertinent to this conversation. You wrote, Christian culture is, is pushing against the grief of motherhood. Citing scriptures such as Psalm 127, 3, 4, it says, Behold, children are a blessing from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. So unpack that for us. Yeah, it's been something that as you brought that out, I looked back at my book. I'm like, oh, that wasn't unpacked very well. And after my book published, I started to see like there's so much more to write on this. And so this is really where I'm at in the journey right now is wanting to unpack more of this in blogs and writing. And so thank you for the opportunity to do that in this conversation. I think grief of motherhood is a very confusing phrase. Um, it's, it's confusing to people because grief of death makes so much more sense it's than true. grief of motherhood. Um, isn't motherhood a gift while death is an enemy to, to be defeated? Isn't motherhood through adoption a beautiful representation of the gospel while death is a harsh reminder of the fall of man? Yes. And so how are we wrestling with grief of motherhood? And I think what it really boils down to is allowing us in our lives to be lived in tension, allowing us to sit in the unease of the gray area um, Jody Landers has a quote that's more or less famous in adoption circles. Okay. It says, um, an, a child born to another woman calls me mother, calls me mom. The depth of the tragedy and the magnitude of the privilege is not lost on me. And there's tension in there. There's this big and statement living in the and the depth of the tragedy and the magnitude of the privilege. And unfortunately, Psalm 127 was slapped on my motherhood okay. the same way Romans 828 was slapped on my grief. Like God's working this for your good. I'm like, oh, but there's so much to work out. Yeah. And as I've been wrestling with my, the depth of the tragedy of the reality that two of my children were born to another woman and on Mother's Day, I get all the flowers and I'm like, does she like, there's just, there's so much grief in this. And Psalm 127 was given to me, like, you're so blessed to have, the, your children are so blessed to have you. I'm like, okay, let's unpack this a little bit mm. because um, it's really, really hard to say that adoption is God's plan. Like, I think it's his redemptive plan, but it's, yeah. it stems from an immense amount of brokenness. And so when my husband read that chapter, he read that section in the, in the book, he, he understood what I was saying, but he pushed back a little bit. He's like, I, I think you need a little bit more believing that children are a heritage from the Lord, like a blessing from the Lord. We were thrust into parenting during COVID. We got three children under the age of two in less than a year. We went from zero children to three under the age of two in less than a year during COVID when we were both still working, no maternity leave for my foster daughter because I was, I was having my biological son three months later. So we were just like, like completely thrust into parenting. And then just as we found our footing, my dad died. And so it's, only now with like four years of perspective of parenting that I can see more of the truth of that verse. Children are a blessing from the Lord, but adoption still really complicates it. And so I think unpacking what I wrote there is allowing us to live in the tension of the, the depth of tra tragedy and the magnitude of the privilege. Mm -hmm. I love this so much just because, um, again, it's not often talked about. Um, I wanted to to, to tell you because um, I actually pitched a book on the grief of motherhood and um, 
it didn't get picked up. <laughs> It's a very uncomfortable topic. It's a very uncomfortable topic. So when I saw that you wrote it, I was like, yes, we're going to talk about this because it needs to be talked about. Mm -hmm. Like, wow. And then um, just how you're bringing out the points of just with adoption and foster care, how, you know, again, another area that's not talked about as much as as well. And then just, I, I love how you're bringing out those dualities of um, tragedy and privilege. And so I, I'm actually a birth mom, like that's part of my story um, that I share in my book. And and so I'm resonating with things that you're saying, you're like Mother's, Mother Day, Mother's Day comes around. And, you know, like you say, you're getting the flowers and you're like, well, you know, but what about her? Yeah. Wow. And so, you know, so I'm, it's really resonate with me as well, because I grieve that every day for myself, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so. In in that same in that same vein, um, it seems as though you've ca kind of categorized that that grief into three categories. And like this it's the grief, grief of the woman you once were like the motherhood and loss, and then the adoption culture that reminds us of, mm -hmm. of both tragedy and privilege that we were just kind of talking about, and then grief of your children. And, and so in what ways have you navigated through these types of grief, um, like with the motherhood and loss? Yeah. The, the grief of the woman I once was, I think like all moms can kind of relate to that. And yeah. so that's why grief of motherhood shouldn't be such a taboo phrase because all moms lose their impromptu date nights. Like all, mo all moms lose the ability to go to the bathroom by their side. <laughs> so, like all moms by, by becoming moms lose someone who they once were. And, and that's why like living in the tension is so important because having children is a beautiful thing, but there's a loss that comes with it. So I don't, I just don't want to ignore, it's okay to, to grieve your career. Like you give up, you willingly give up your career for children, but you still lose something. So it's okay. So I think that is just a normal grief that, that I want to normalize more. Like, it's yeah. okay to grieve the woman you once were, even if you love the life that you're now living. And so that's that. Adoption culture, that one's hard. In Christian culture, I mean, and I think in culture in general, adoption is viewed as a very beautiful thing. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's not, but when I think it hit us, it hit us the hardest when we got the phone call from our caseworker that termination of parental rights went through on our daughter. So in court, the judge signed off that we're going to terminate her biological parents' rights so that you can move forward with adoption. Of course, that was what we were praying for. Yeah, like, yeah. That's what we wanted. But as, as we got the phone call, I was like, oh, this isn't right. Parents' rights are not supposed to be terminated. And so there was tension in that as, I mean, we've heard it said adoption is like a birthday, a funeral and a wedding all in mm -hmm. one. How, how do you celebrate? How, how do we live in the tension of celebrating my children leaving one family and uniting with another just as they would in a wedding, but mm -hmm. s severing the ties of no longer being a part of the family that gave them a birthday. That's the language we use. My children have a mom who gave them a birthday and a mom who gave them a family. And then I think one of the things that's extremely confusing and very complex is that my biological son is my youngest. And so even this morning, this morning, he said to me, why don't I have a mom who gave me a birthday? said, <clears throat> you do. <Yeah. laughs> he goes, well, why don't I have a mom who gave me a family? I'm like, you are part of my family. I, I am both for you. He's like, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. Okay. So most children 
have one mom. All of your cousins have one mom. But what's complicated in our family is that the ratio of our children, we have more adopted children than we do biological children. And he's the youngest one. So he's learning from them that it's normal to have two moms and two dads. It's normal to, he's like super jealous that he doesn't get to go to weekly therapy sessions with the state. I'm like, okay. Mm. He's just, it. that's so complicated to navigate. And, and sadly, like, I think one of the biggest griefs is, is I didn't have room in my heart for my biological child because we were working so hard to attach to our adopted children. Mm -hmm. He's four next month. And we're just realizing we're not like, we're not attached to him because we thought it would be a shoe in. We thought like blood would just mean attachment. And we've worked so hard to attach to our other children that things are coming out in his life. That's very revealing. He we're not attached. And I'm like, Okay, like working so hard on what makes sense to work on mm -hmm. working with our adopted children and then like really not giving him the extra special attention because he's biological and like, well, all my other friends, biological children are just attached and that's normal. So again, it's the it's the tension and the complexity of adoptions of beautiful thing yeah. but a really messy thing like my children have two moms I sat across the courtroom from a woman while the judge decided the fate of a boy that we both loved and both considered to be a son and so it's like only now years later that it's it's a miracle yeah the whole story it's a miracle mm -hmm. She and I call ourselves friends, but our friends really complicate things. Our friendships really complicate right. things because my biological son has said before, Sarah's my other mom. I'm like, no, that's just not the way it works. So it's just, um, I'm still navigating it. I'm yeah. still like, I don't have the answers. And I think that's one of the, that's really, that's really hard in Christian culture. We want answers. Yes. We want answers for the suffering. We want answers for the hardship. We want answers for if we can't tie it in a bow, we're like super uncomfortable. So we're just going to like shove it under the rug. And like, we know that that's not where the healing, the healing doesn't come under the rug. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, just the the honesty of of just kind of um of saying you know you're you're still navigating through it and that's <laughs> and if we're honest because you know none of us are experts we are really just walking through this um allowing god to to sit with us when you know during all of this to um walk through it with us and we're all yeah walking through it and figuring it out as as we go along um and I'll, you know, and just all these little different pieces to the puzzle that bring in um, us holding complex emotions and complex situations. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it can be so much. And mm -hmm. so thank you for just sharing all of these different aspects of just adoption and, and how, because most often, especially in Christian culture, the adoption is amazing. It's wonderful. Like I said, it's part of my story. Um, I placed my son in adoptive care when I was in high school because it was a teen preg pregnancy and, mm -hmm. um, and all those things, but we don't get to he often hear the, the, this other side of that, of how there's the brokenness of those pieces, the, the tragedies and, and things in between and how it plays out like full spectrum. And, and like you're saying, your biological kids in, in that blended family. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just appreciate you so much and just sharing your story um, yeah, just you. to bring more awareness really. And to normalize again, the losses that are even experienced in that. Mm -hmm. and, and we can almost call those invisible. I mean, 
put into that category of invisible grief, because if just say if someone if I met you, you know, unless I sat down and had this conversation, I wouldn't know that. I'd be like, oh, my gosh, she adopted, you know, like three kids and, you know, she has one of her own and things are just, oh, my gosh, this is just an amazing story, you know. And mm -hmm. so we wouldn't know. So it's invisible until we have these honest, honest conversations to say, no, you know, it's not just like a little a bow, like I adopted some kids and then we are like living in Disney World or Disneyland, you know, like, yeah. yeah. So, um, so again, I just appreciate. Thank story. you. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the grief too, that our children are carrying. And I think oh, yeah. that's, that's what's making this grief of motherhood so much scarier than the grief of losing my dad is like, mm -hmm. I could put my dad's death in a box. Yeah. Like he, he died. I could, journey through all of the good and the good memories and the hurts and the things that didn't get resolved. And, and I could do that. But as I'm, as I'm grieving my motherhood and I'm parenting my children through it, we got our si we got our son when he was six months old. So there wasn't a lot of life before our family, but there was life before our family. And he asks questions about before our family that one, I don't have answers to, mm. two, I don't know what happened. And so I, I have questions too, that we start like trying to attribute, well, this must have happened, which like, and there's a grief that they are carrying in their little bodies that, I mean, it's becoming normalized in culture. Like if, if we want our children to be regulated, we need to be regulated. Like, I'm really glad for these conversations, but there's a, a depth of trauma yeah. that they're carrying. Even my daughter that we got from the hospital, like was separated from her mom, the mom who carried her. So like, just because you adopt a baby from, a, from the hospital, mm -hmm. there's an extreme amount of trauma. And that's one that is very eye-opening <laughs> to the church. Like, oh, but I thought you got her from the hospital. And I'm like, but I'm not her, I'm not the mom who carried her. She knew another voice and mm. rhythm of body for mm. nine months. And then as I hold her and try to attach to her, I've got a six-month you know, I'm six months pregnant. And so it's just this, the the depth of the tragedy and the trauma that my children are carrying and that I'm trying to parent them through as I'm unpacking it. That's what makes grief of motherhood so much bigger, which is why like the book needed to be picked up when you pitched it. It's there's, there's so many layers of it that really, really need to be talked about so that when my children lose it in kids church, our church volunteers are not like, hey, pastor's kids, what's your problem? Right. Like They're carrying so much pain. Wow, 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 wow. That's so powerful. So, so, so powerful. Um, I just had a conversation last week um, with um, Aubrey Sampson. And it's gonna, it's another powerful conversation, but we had that conversation like most, the most often overlooked um, in the grief space is the children. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. So, and it's one that I haven't really even, I haven't dived into. And so mm -hmm. I'm eager to listen to that conversation. I know Clarissa Mull is doing a lot more writing on yes. grief in children and and I think, because, again, because my children haven't experienced a death. Mm -hmm. Both of their biological parents are alive. Both of their adoptive parents are alive. They haven't experienced a close death. It's an invisible grief that people are yes. like, it should be okay. Yes. So it's a yes. lot. To unpack. That's a lot to unpack, yes. And just because it's an invisible grief makes it even worse. I mean, I don't want to... I, I never put weight on grief, but just saying because it's not visible. People aren't acknowledging it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So um, so we kind of talked about like um, the trauma and brokenness that may be brought into the home through foster care mm -hmm. and adoption. 
it's still, I mean, this can be like another episode within itself because that's just still more layers to the story, right? Of, mm -hmm. With foster care and adoption. Um, so yeah, just kind of, if you can share like what, what that looks like. I know we kind of, we touched on it in bits and pieces, but for someone who's not familiar with like the process, maybe, mm -hmm. um, just maybe kind of give us like a streamline of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Sure. We have a very typical foster care journey. Okay. I wanted to adopt, but when we looked at international adoption, like I just didn't, we didn't feel called to spend the money. Some people do. Kids need adopted, like yeah. not saying anything against that. When we looked at domestic adoption, I was very uncomfortable with the list of waiting parents waiting to be chosen. And I've got friends who are doing that. And so that was just for us that I wasn't comfortable with it. So we stepped into foster care. Um, but it, it took about, it was a 12 week training program and it took about six weeks into the training for me to switch my mindset and really get on board with foster care. Foster care is not about adoption. And we were told that right when we met with our licensing agent, it was a gift. It was a gift that we didn't know we needed that our licensing agent is a strong Christian. Oh. So he talked about the spiritual warfare that we were inviting into our home. He said, when you choose to foster, you choose to suffer. Hmm. He said, foster care is about families for children. It is not about children for families. So he asked us, have you tried to have your own kids? We said, no. He goes, okay, that's good. <laughs> because so many people go into foster care thinking we can get, we can get kids for our family. Like, but the goal of foster care is return home. And so it took me about six weeks of, of weekly training to stop saying my goal is adoption because I was fighting the system. Like, we didn't have kids yet. We're still in training, but I was mentally fighting the system and knew that if I was really going to get on board with foster care, I had to give up my dreams of adoption because none of that is promised in foster care because the goal is reunification. So the Lord was, the Lord knew my heart. He, he knew my dreams. He knew, you know, yeah. what, what we longed for. And our second placement, our second, our second foster care placement was a six month old boy who was ready to be adopted, which is so, so unusual. My friends who are interested in adoption are like, how did you get a baby from the foster? I'm like, it doesn't work. This way. It doesn't work this way. And so the fact that we got him at six months and then his sister was born and we got her from the hospital through foster care. It's a very atypical foster care situation. And so even as we are we are uh, ministry leaders for a foster and adoptive support group at our church, and we are walking with traditional foster parents for the first time of a, a child being in, their, being in their home for four years, and like the goal is still return home. Wow. And so we haven't navigated that grief yet as a group because half of our group is traditional adoption. We are the foster family that adopted from foster care. And so, so um, if anyone's interested in, in learning more about foster care, I would absolutely recommend foster the family, Jamie Finn. Her um, Instagram has got some hard hitting, really important truths when it comes to traditional foster care, but we don't have a traditional foster care experience. Um, and so even that has made it, like I said, it's made it complicated because people look at us and like, how did you get a baby? I'm like, we didn't we, like yeah. this fell into our lap. I think the Lord knew, I think he knew even our, um, like our weaknesses in, I'm, I'm wearing a shirt that says get too attached. Like that's one of people's biggest fears. I could never oh. do that. I would get too attached. And there's, there's language out there. Uh, Jamie Finn, Jason Johnson, you need, you need to get too attached because the kids, the kids need your attachment more than you need to be afraid mm. to attached. And so 
my husband and I would love to step back into foster care. When our kids are older, we relinquished our license because it is a first family's first mentality as foster care is about reunification. You're fighting for the first family. And as we've adopted our children from foster care, they are now our first family. And so when we looked into uh, re-upping our license and we were still getting phone calls for an eight-year-old who needed a home and we looked at our family and we're like, we got, we got a mess here <laughs> that we really need to, like, we need to stabilize some stuff. I was, my dad had, to, like, it was not appropriate for us to bring in kids. And so it's still our heart to do foster care down the road. And I know a lot of people say that and we'll never get around to it. Um, we'll see, but that's, that's one of the things that is, I think just the church needs to know about foster care is it's, it's fighting for first families. It's fighting for reunification and, that's an it's a whole it's yeah. a whole other podcast. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that and just kind of clarifying some things. And um, again, it's about bringing awareness, um, especially I feel like in in the church with the big C church, just of how to hold space for for foster parents, for foster kids, like holding space and and not um, making assumptions or. Um, no, um, just acknowledging that there could be some invisible grief and there probably is some grief there mm -hmm. and, and just making space for um, those families in church and in community, really. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so just thanks so much for that. Um, mm -hmm. I want to um, I have a few more questions, just kind of bring us to a close. Um, so in what ways with all these things that you have shared with us today, have you found how... Um, in what ways has God met you mm -hmm. in your motherhood and loss? Mm -hmm. I listened to a podcast once and the start of the podcast was like the most freeing thing that I had ever heard in motherhood. He started the podcast. It was Paul Tripp. He mm -hmm. started the podcast. The podcast said motherhood isn't difficult. I'm sure he said parenting. Parenting isn't difficult. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. I was like, yes. <laughs> I was so like, ah, uh, the freedom of the gospel that it is not up to us to save our children. It's not up to us to fix it. My husband and I went into foster care. He was really propelled into foster care on a quote that he heard at a conference at the end of your life, you'll be measured on one of two things. How many rewards have you built for yourself or how many people have you rescued? And he's like, let's do foster care. And so fast forward, that was probably six years ago. We did not know the internal pressure that we were putting on ourselves because of that quote. Like it is our job to rescue these children. It is, it is not our job to rescue no. these children. There is, there are some messes in life that are so knotted up, only Jesus can unknot them. And likely it will only be unknotted at the return of his kingdom. Mm -hmm. There are some things in life that are so broken. And I do believe in redeemable things. I do, I've seen it. I've seen, it's the story of me and our son's first mom, like, the miracle that we are friends, he redeems broken things here on this earth. But there are some things that are so knotted up that like we can't untangle, like we can't untangle. And I think moms in our culture feel a pressure from hustle culture, from just the pressure of motherhood, like trust in your pediatrician and your doctor's teams. They will give you the answers trust like and so we're we're hustling and calling doctors and calling and like finding answers and when the 
when the allergist or the psych doesn't have the right answer, we're like crushed because we're putting our hope in things of this world to fix what only Jesus can fix. And there, again, I want to say, there are things that he will fix and he'll fix it through doctors. Like there are things, I'm not saying don't try, but don't put your hope in things being fixed in this world. Because he says, in this world, you will have trouble, but I have, take heart, I have overcome the world. And so that is one of the ways that the Lord has met me in just completely releasing me of the pressure. I I can't unknot my my children's story. Yeah. And then adding my biological son into, I can't unknot it. And maybe the Lord will give us wisdom and point us to therapists who will help unknot it. But I'm not going to put my hope on this therapist because then I'm putting the pressure on her to be Jesus for me. That's good. So he will redeem. He's coming back. He promises to make all things new. And that's one of the immense beauties of suffering is that it makes us long for him to come back. I don't know how many times in the last week I've paused from the chaos of our life and said, come Lord Jesus. Yes. This is not an escape mentality. I'm living in it. He's called me to it, but it's a biblical mentality. Yes, he, he wants us to long for the day that he returns. And I think it's a gift that my dad's death gave me. I think it's a gift that the hardship of motherhood has given me that I'm longing. I'm longing for the day that he returns to make it all right. Yes, absolutely. Same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, um, I was going to ask for words of hope that you can leave with the listeners, but that was like so hopeful. <laughs> Those were words of hope, but I wanted to, um, because I, when I was reading your book and I landed on and underlined and I didn't, I didn't put it in the, um, the questions that I sent to you, but um, chapter 12, just mm -hmm. the title of this chapter is so hopeful that I just want to say here, and maybe you say a few words about it, but it's Christ's presence is more permanent than my grief. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is a, one of the most hopeful statements because again, in, in grief culture, <laughs> And I say grief culture, but in, in this space, um, it's easy to become hopeless. And so this this statement, I feel like it's just so powerful that Christ's presence is more permanent than my grief. Mm -hmm. And so can you say a few words of hope even kind of surrounding that? Yeah. On um, so so in the theme of my writing, this this came up on the one year anniversary of my dad's death. And I was in that place, culture says it's time to move on. It's been a year. And I'm like, hmm, not really ready to move on. But I'm also not ready to sit in the hurt. Like I'm not ready to live here. And so it, it was actually an article um, from Pastor Matt Klinger. Klingler. Um, I quote him a lot in this last chapter. He's the one who, who wrote that, that Christ's presence is more permanent than our grief. And I have come back to this last chapter many times as I've been grieving my motherhood because there are, there are times that I feel so alone in the trials of motherhood. And it says in this chapter, like you are his, even on the days that you are believing you are alone in the trial. And I come back to that time and time again, because he has proved himself faithful. And I think even in Revelation, we read, he will wipe away the tears from our eyes. That means there are tears that are there. Yeah. And so he, he, and I wrote this just with a, with a year gone by. And I asked my friend, and I said this in the beginning of the chapter, I asked my friend whose mom had been gone for like 10 years. 
what would you what would you say is the thing that you've learned and she said his presence has never failed me and so there i i've idolized the hard i've idolized the grief i've lived in the grief in a, in an attempt to be seen in an attempt to be cared for i've lived there and, and I know that's a sin. It's an idol. I've had to repent of it. And so in this attempt to, once again, like, let's bring the conversation full circle, live in the tension. Mm, that's good. Grief, grief is a companion who will walk with us the rest of our days. And that's a, that was a very hard thing for my husband to hear. It was a very hard thing for him to understand that now that grief has entered our lives, we, we, we will never be the same. We're never going back to normal. We will find a new normal, but grief will walk with us the rest of our days. But Jesus's presence is more powerful. It's more peaceful. He's the one who gives us our peace while grief gives us all the other emotions. Yeah. His presence is more permanent than our grief because our grief will ebb and flow. It will always be with us, but it's not as, it's not as powerful. It's not as unchanging. Like mm -hmm. he's with us, he's with us. And that's something that in grief culture, we have to fight for. We have to fight for the truths. And that's why I wrote, I wrote this book and I wrote some of my devotions on my Instagram account I was the first person to say, stop throwing scripture at me. It's yes. not helpful. Mm -hmm. There is a place when your heart is ready for it, for you to go find scripture, for the Lord to meet you with his words of truth, which with his words of peace and his words of hope. When, you're, when your heart's not ready for it, church, please stop. <laughs> stop. Yes. But when our heart is ready for it, the Lord will meet us in there because I really believe the Bible is the word of life. Yeah. Jesus is the hope of the world. And so I write in my book, we don't want people like um, covering our hurt with the hope of scripture. There is hope in scripture, but I, I more than ever have, I'm learning to live in the tension of the, of the both and. Yeah. And so that wasn't like the cleanest answer. <laughs> oh no. I love it. It is, it is perfect. Yes, absolutely. Love it so much. Um, so just to bring it to a close, <laughs> How can listeners, and I'm like wiping tears, I'm like, okay. But anyways, how can listeners connect with you and where, because um, like you say, you write devotion devotionals um, on Instagram and of course your book. So how can mm -hmm. listeners connect with you and where can they um, get a copy of your book? So my book sold on Amazon and I'm currently just on Instagram. I didn't plan on being a writer. I didn't dream of being a writer. Um, it's something that I've always loved, but I work at our church and I'm a busy mom. And so I didn't, I didn't plan on like starting a platform. Um, and so we're like hyper committed to the local church. A lot of people in my church have read my book and I'm like, if it gets beyond the walls of my church, praise be to God, but I'm hyper committed to my local church. And so I'm not like in a lot of places. I'm on Instagram at Emily Ann Lawson. And I do have some free devotions that are linked in my bio. Um, my book's on Amazon. I'm working on another book on the grief of motherhood. So maybe we could partner on that one. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, as I started writing it, my husband's like, slow down. I'm like, I know, I know. But I think I wrote this as a way to heal from my dad's death. And I'm like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna write to heal in my motherhood as well. Yeah. So yeah, so I'm not, I'm not in a lot of places, but they can connect with me on Amazon and on Instagram. Oh, I love it so much. Um, yes. It's like, thank you so much for this time. I thank you for your story. I thank you for your heart. And um, again, just bringing awareness to these, to motherhood and loss is just so important. So I thank you for your ministry. 
Um, so thanks so much for sitting with us today, sitting with me. Thanks so much, Natasha. That brings me to the end of this episode. Thanks again for joining me and thanks for listening to you. Can you just sit with me? If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to come back for my next episode of Can You Just Sit With Me? Until then, this is Natasha Smith helping you to find hope in grief, hope in the hard place, and hope in the challenging times of life. Be sure to connect with me across social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at I'm Natasha Smith.